Listen. So Eli Roth has another slasher that's about Thanksgiving that in a lot of places is being titled Black Friday since it's about how crazy those sales used to be that people would slash each other faster than those prices. But now, you know, you got to watch it and it's kind of like a period piece because... Well, ain't nobody going out to the store like that. It's based on a spoof trailer that he did back in the day in 2007 that was a part of Tarantino's and Rodriguez's Grindhouse movies that was his double feature where the Splat Pack got together to make a bunch of crazy fake trailers that would play before the movie. And one by one, all of those have actually started to become real feature-length films. We always dreamed of doing a Thanksgiving-themed slasher film. It was the only major holiday without a killer. Now, the original trailer's still up on YouTube, which is kind of crazy because everything that happens in that little short is way worse than what happens in this feature-length movie. It actually got to the point that Roth had to come out and explain that this new movie is a remake of that movie, that somehow that trailer ended up being an original film that was so nasty, they had to throw it away, and this is like the sanitized reboot remake of that movie? Which I'm not going to lie, kind of sounds like an insult to your own movie. You will never get this experience again. A horror movie only works the very first time you see it. It's never as scary the second time. Personally, I think it's a gory fun time to have with your friends if the trailer interested you. Definitely worth the rent it. And again, if it looked like it piqued your interest, then definitely worth the junior price. So with that, a full spoiler warning out of the way as I get into spoilers. Let me explain. Let's see. So the movie takes place in Plymouth, Massachusetts on Thanksgiving, where it's being shot like it's Halloween. And right away, if you pay close attention, it kind of gives away who the killer is by the camera angles. That's when we meet two families who are hosting dinners, like this rich family where our lead Jessica comes from. She's super pissed that her rich daddy has proposed to his real estate fiance. So now she has a stepmom that came with the new house. But her pop is also the owner of the super depot in town called Right Mart. That's what leads this other family having their Thanksgiving ruined because the manager gets called in on the busiest day of the year since since Black Friday now starts on a Thursday. But really, it starts on Labor Day. Honestly, it never ends. Jessica then dips on her dinner to go hang out with her friends. There's Bobby, her baseball star boyfriend, Scuba and Yulia, who are also dating, her friend Gabby, played by Addison Ray, whose acting actually wasn't the scariest part of the movie, and her jock boyfriend Evan, who pitches them taking a detour to the store because he needs a new phone to text during the movie they're about to go watch. Once they get there, the place is absolutely packed since they're giving out a free item to the first 100 buyers, but because Jessica's dad is the owner, they're able to sneak in through the side, making fun of everyone who's on the outside, so when those doors open, they rush in there like those deals were to die for. This is insane! Like they want these waffle irons so bad, they were turning this guy into a pancake? It gets so bad you'd think Travis was in town? Like they weren't even checking out at the register. They were pulling a five finger discount, dealing with scalp pricing. They end up killing several people, including the manager's wife, who gets in a hit and run with a cart. Bobby gets his pitching hand squished, ruining his career. And Evan the Jock just films the whole thing to go viral. You know, it's about the perversion of the holiday. This, this holiday is about being thankful and I'm so happy happy that, you know, it just bleeds over with Black Friday where you're so thankful at dinner and then you run out and trample over your neighbor for a waffle iron. But there's a sickness underneath because it's not greed. It's because everybody's pay has been reduced to nothing. It's these overlords at the top that are sitting in their mansions making us play these gladiator games, you know, this, you know, fighting for these products, but that's the only time everybody can get stuff on sale to get the gifts for their kids. So as much as it's an indictment of capitalism, it's really about the greedy at the top that make the masses fight at the bottom. But also, like, don't watch it on streaming or else it won't be over 10 bucks a ticket for them. So right now, what you're trying to say is that people have to watch Thanksgiving and be grateful. They have to see it in a theater because it'll be the most fun they've had in a movie in their entire lives. One year later, the town just pretends like nothing ever happened since nobody was arrested because all of the security footage from the storm magically disappeared even though there was a viral video that made nationwide news. And I'm tired of pretending like everything is normal and it's not. So while there are some extras protesting the store reopening by calling it Reichmart, everybody else is focused on the town's anniversary. A side bit of the story is that in 2020, they had printed out all of these John Carver masks, but never got to celebrate because of the lockdown. So now they have so many of them that they're just giving them out at the diner with a coffee. That's where the new cop gets introduced on the scene, who's working alongside McDreamy Sheriff Eric actually had a pretty wicked accent. And he said, I've always wanted to play a character like this. I grew up in Maine in a small town and I can use my real accent. I said, what are you talking about? I was like, this isn't how you talk. He goes, no, my accent, I got like a New England accent. I had to lose it when I became an actor. So the accent that Patrick's using is the accent he grew up with. Thanksgiving is an institution here. It's a John Carver mask. First governor of New Plymouth Colony. Ever since the accident, Bobby Baseball goes to Jessica, and so she's moved on to the new guy, Ryan, who only gets accepted by the group because he buys them Pat Steeler tickets. 
Keeping with that theme of greed, but it's at that diner where the group of friends get tagged in a post that's setting up a dinner table with their names on it, since the killer knows what they did last Thanksgiving. On top of that, someone stole an axe and vandalized the real John Carver's house, who was one of the main pilgrims who sailed over here. He's actually the guy who founded Plymouth before taking out more bodies than they do in this movie. And the legend goes that he was even killing pilgrims, leaving marks on them, with no one knowing how to stop the massacre until John Carver himself died. But you're not taught as a kid that the reason the Native Americans are wiped out is because they had Thanksgiving and saved the pilgrims and taught them how to survive the winter. It, it actually was what wipe them all out. This leads to the first kill, which is Lizzie the waiter, who was going vicious over that waffle iron in the opening. And what's interesting is that the actress actually is a descendant of the real John Carver. So, you know, she thought it was an honor to get killed, and done like her family name. At first she gets iced to the point that her phone can't pick up her face ID. Then she gets rushed over to the dumpster where the killer rams her, splitting her in two and putting her bottoms on top of Right Mart, giving them a new take on half off. We then get a bunch of new characters, like the detective who's come in to investigate, this nerdy kid who's like way too small to even carve on his desk, and McCarty, the local party planning drug dealer who's actually based on Eli's longtime effects buddy who did the original trailer. Bobby eventually comes back, and since he's super jealous of Jessica moving on, he convinces her to go into her dad's hard drives to get this super secret footage of that night that for some reason no one's gotten. And they end up printing out a picture of Ryan who was meeting up with somebody only for the whole thing to just be a complete cop-out. Ryan's fine, he's just harmless, like an NPC, but he messes with the group dynamic. The next kill ends up being the other security guard from that night that's played by a comedian, Tim Dillon, who I know didn't have any funny lines, but casting him as someone who was supposed to protect all these people, it's a pretty good joke. It's an American holiday! I don't even know what he did wrong though, because other than not becoming a barricade that night, he just gets slashed with an electric carver for no reason. He then gets sliced so the killer can put his head on a platter, thus tagging them all again in another post. And honestly, these practical kills is where the movie shines the most. I love the MPAA and they're cool and it's never a fight with them and they get what I do and their intention is to help protect the movie. So that version, whereas like in New Zealand, they'll just, those two minutes are out because it's the government, it's elected officials. So they're right. never gonna defend Gore. So in America, it's self-policing so that we don't have government interference. The third kill comes from the rival school couple who was mentioned earlier in the movie and also rushed in on Black Friday. They end up going to the gym to sneak away for some sexy time, but before she can give him some neck, the killer snaps his. That then leads to the cheerleader doing the splits and getting split. But fun fact, Addison Rae was actually the stunt double here and gives her her first credit being one since I guess she would have been an elite gymnast if she didn't go the TikTok route. But they also kept this version pretty PG-13 compared to what the original trailer was. Like, overall, if you go watch the original trailer, it really is way worse than the entire feature is here. You know, if, if there wasn't someone I was that as comfortable with, I wouldn't be able to be that relaxed and do all those things. And that's what makes the scene fun. I'll pretend like you're huge. <laughs> pretend, thank you. <laughs> She'll pretend like I'm huge. The group then struggles with coming up with a plan to stay safe and also how they're gonna plagiarize their upcoming assignments. And that leads to Evan and Gabby getting kidnapped by the killer, who then uses their phones to bait Jessica into a hallway. We then get a pretty decent cat and mouse chase in the makeup department of the school that starts playing on who the killer might be. Cause earlier you did see Evan play with a head, but during this chase, the killer swings his bat around like Bobby the baseball player would. So the sheriff mentioning how it's the small mistakes that leads to the killer getting caught really does make sense because John Carver is trying to dupe the characters. Be careful who you trust. But other times, it's just like trying to trick the audience sitting in the theater who paid for a ticket. So to me, when they do that and they're not being consistent, it kind of feels like a cop out to the mystery. As far as the actor in the mask, when you're physically doing that stuff, I had a bunch of different actors do it because I didn't want you to be able to identify one person's body language. The next kill comes with their friend Yulia, whose mobster father wants to take her away to Florida before things get crazier. But before she can pack, she gets packed. And I like how in order to get this corn cob kill, they actually had to film it in reverse. So that's the actress flipping her screen. It's such a cheap trick. It's so simple. We just had him pull it away because you can't do that and stop. You just got to pull it and reverse it. So, but the actor has to act in reverse. So it's just like, ah, you have to go, ah. During that, Jessica and Scuba went to McCarty's party in order to get some guns and arrive at Yulia's locked and loaded and locked because the killer gets away right in front of them as Yulia falls on this table saw, gutting herself completely as she leaves these two in the splash zone. Scuba's just a total badass. I should kick your ass right here. What do I do? Shoot at me! 
school was not a badass in that moment. The group then grabs the leftovers of the leftovers and decides to create a plan to bait the killer at the annual Thanksgiving parade. But Carver's so smart, he's already switching masks before the franchise even starts. That way he's sneaking around and is able to behead a turkey in front of everybody. He gets this driver shifted as these three get darted and charted over to his secret lair where he sets them up for a Thanksgiving dinner. That's where he's been seasoning up Jessica's stepmom who on a rewatch you realize the real killer was actually asking her earlier about her eggplant recipe. Now he's slicing and dicing her as she tries to escape but before she can even make it out to the lawn she gets right back in and then gets stuffed into the oven for 375. It is going to be a a very happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> Not to mention, this man really charred his mask medium well, so now he has variants. Carver then gathers everyone around for a live stream dinner that he claims is going to be more famous in 1621s. He then goes around the table asking what they're thankful for as he pours some cheerleader wine, bashes Evan over the head like Glenn, and gets the dad to vomit when he's forced to eat his wife who's been cooking all day. Man, talk about going from consumers to consume her. Now, the cops aren't able to catch him since Carver's using a voice mod and is always switching it out so that his self-service doesn't get tracked. But eventually, Jessica does escape by using the ring knife that McCarty gave her, even freeing Scuba, who for some reason decided to run instead of bum-rushing this guy. Like you're on the football team. This man's been surviving on cranberry sauce and coffee beat him up. Instead, they rush out, leading Jessica to get away, and then just randomly finding the sheriff knocked out on the street, which you already know was a little fishy. When he wakes up, he claims that Bobby did it, and that he tried locking him up, thinking he was the bad guy, before getting knocked out, so now everyone's out searching for him. Jessica then gets put into this office so that she can recollect herself and also recollect the clues, as she notices the burrs on the sheriff's shoes, which is exactly what the killer got caught in when she was getting chased. Oh my god. Now listen. McDreamy won Sexiest Man again this year, and now you finally got a movie where his looks kill. And I've been waiting for this since Scream 3. Right from the start, he had that opening shot from his point of view walking up to the house on Thanksgiving like they were filming that intro from Halloween. So before he even got into his Michael Myers jumper, they were leaving clues on why he became the killer. It turns out that he was actually cheating with manager Mitch's wife, who was going to leave her mans after the holidays since she already had McDreamy's baby in the oven. Wow, you baked this. Yeah, you know, for a single guy, I know my way around the oven. Have a feeling you're not going to be single for long. Come on. So you already know someone was going to get roasted. After the crowd killed his wife and child, he made a plan to go after everyone who was there that night and had a speaking role in the cast. And I guess he really likes Thanksgiving because he put a lot of effort into the theming. Somehow, while doing his live stream when he was back in the station, he also found time to drug Bobby, who he was going to pin it on, but Bobby bobbed him before the blame. As he's holding Jess hostage, she realizes he's the killer and gives thanks for her service as she live streams his entire villain confession off Bobby's phone. You know, the mask is what you wear when you're killing, but there's also another mask, and that's the mask you put on for everybody else. So somehow Bobby got a notification on the phone he didn't have and pops in right where he needs to be in time to rescue her. They then rush to the warehouse where Jess inflates this turkey, which for some reason was connected to a propane tank and starts prepping her musket since earlier she stopped the movie to tell you she knows how to prep a musket. But because she has no bullets, she loads it with her mom's beads that she left behind for her, leading her to musket tears, but also to save the day. In the end, they live long enough to see a sequel, but Jess continues to get nightmares since they never found Sheriff Carver's body, instead hinting that he escaped as a firefighter, just like the ending to another horror slasher, which if you know, you know. Now to me, Eli Roth is a master of horror, especially when it comes to producing, because he's done a bunch of stuff with Crypt TV, his Shutter Docs. One of the things that really stood out to me on this research was the fact that he took John Watts under his wing when he had made a hostile parody for a short film called Clown, and then he produced that and turned it into a feature film. And now John Watts has directed a whole trilogy of Spider-Man movies. The one that always gets me is that Damien Chazelle helped write the script for the last Exorcist sequel, which he was producing, and this was all before he got the gold for Whiplash. So I get why he really wants to push the things giving her so that this can be his like ongoing slasher like scream but where the cast only gets cut on screen so looking back at all of those spoof trailers from grindhouse we did get machete and a machete sequel hobo with a shotgun got made so now we're just waiting on don't which is like edgar wright's nope and it's only a matter of time till we get the one starring the one and only nicholas cage as fu manchu <laughs> more out of life. Go out to a movie.